Good morning, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Juma in the Sabi Sands, South Africa, where the weather is a very chilly 14 degrees Celsius, 57 degrees Fahrenheit. And thank you to the Zoomies for finding us one of what we think is the Avoca male. Uh, he was on the damn cam. He's now moving directly east away from the dam. And don't forget to send to your questions and hashtag Safari Life. There he's going. Not sure what his plans are. Ralph heard him calling, or at least one mail line calling early this morning. And then he, this guy materialized on the dam cam. Thank you for those people who guided us to him. He's now headed though into a place where Tingana was two days ago. And it is a very tricky little block that we're going into. We're going to see if we can stay with him. But for the moment, uh oh, not that way. For the moment, we are still here. And it is a lovely day in South Africa. I wonder how everyone is doing. Oh, Craigo, what's going on? The entire pathway is suddenly blocked. <laughs> okay, he's walking in towards the rising sunshine. June, it seems like he's on his own. We didn't see him with any other animal. Um, I didn't hear the calls myself this morning. But he's not 100% relaxed. He's kind of a little bit jumpy. But um, we're going to see if we can stay with him. See if we can stay with him. So the man who introduced us to the lion this morning, Ralph Kirsten, is on Bushwalk. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to a, a very fresh morning out here in the Juma Concession, Greater Kruger National Park of South Africa. What a wonderful start to the morning it has been. I, uh, I had my coffee just before 5 o'clock this morning, and I heard those lions calling off straight in an easterly direction, and I was very sure they were near to Voyatilla Dam. Well, surprise, surprise, there we go, Steve. Good start to the morning. Now, my name is Ralph Kirsten, and on the camera, we've got Davi as my wingman out here on foot and um, we've also got Herbert as our game scout this morning and um, my uh, idea for this morning is actually to head uh, in the direction where I last had Hukumuri, the leopard, uh, who disappeared down into a drainage line just near to Vuyatela Dam. But the reason I want to go there is because we've been losing or seeing a lot of leopard activity moving in that particular drainage line and coming out on Vuyatela Access. That being Tingana, Hukumuri and the elusive Shudulu. Now I want to see what the reason is for them going down into that drainage line um, and maybe there's some little clues for us. Who knows, maybe there's even a site where the hyena have been busy and even potentially where Shudulu might be uh, looking to den. But very interesting, Steve is headed in a easterly direction, um, David has headed in a southerly or southwesterly uh, direction, not southwesterly, southeasterly in that direction over there and we're going to be heading a little bit more uh, west uh, on our morning's walk for now. So, very exciting. Uh, the lions are ready. I'm after some fresh signs of hyena and leopard. Let's go over and see what David's plan for the morning is. Hello everyone and a very good morning from South Africa. My name is David and with me is the great cameraman VM. Very good, and VM knows this area very, very well, and he has told me we will use any possible trucks that we see to see all the leopards that he thinks are here. He knows this area like back of his hand, and a very big welcome to all of you. Remember, this is a very interactive uh, drive. Stay with us on the hashtag Safari Live and also on the YouTube chat. This will be my direction this morning and some trucks were seen here last night, VM tells me, of leopards and lions. I wouldn't know how that could happen to see trucks. It happens once in a while depending on who passed here before the other and those are the trucks we want to follow. Alrighty, we're gonna move and see the luck of the draw and how lucky we'll be. Still cold for me, sorry about that. If you compare it to yesterday morning, it's still chilly, but I have learned one thing. 
have as many layers as possible. Today I got four, which means it's not very bad compared to yesterday. All right. Remember to send us your questions, comments, let us share and let us run the game drive together. Sun is already up now and I'm sure just like yesterday morning it will start warming up. Say that again Kasi. Very, very good morning and jumbo jumbo. Remember, we'll also continue with our Swahili lessons. And we'll be giving you one or two new words as we find out what the lions could be doing now. Well, the lion is doing the same trick that Hosanna and Shidulu and Hukumuri like to do and he has managed to climb up on top of a very nice termite mound and he's disappeared in the feather top chlorous grass that covers it. Isn't it a marvelous shot? I think he's just come up on there to enjoy the sunrise where we found him. He's a little chilly in the drainage depression but he's been walking steadily away from us. I don't think vehicles have spent too much time with him because he's not He's not the most relaxed cat in the world, so we're giving him lots of space. You can see he looks very relaxed there, but when he's walking, not as relaxed as some of the leopards that we spend time with, or the Birmingham boys. And he's having a little nap. <laughs> Marvelous that we got lions on the show so early in the morning. He's just spreading the grass a bit for you there, so you can get a better screenshot. Dave, can you? Uh, sorry, uh, Craig, eh? I forgot to mention that Craig is on camera with me this morning. Sean, I don't know, actually. I've only seen the Evokers once, and not very well. So, I mean, I'm hope, hoping any of you out there are able to tell me. I mean, there's no battle scars on this guy's face. It makes it hard to to identify them without too much sort of of a feature. Um, ears potentially missing. A little clip on the left ear there. He's on his own. Sometimes finding them in a pride or in a couple of males or whatever it might be is a good indication of um, who they are. But finding them on their own... Um, Kirsty and FC reckons it's an evoker. What do you all at home think? I only got a very bad look at them the week before. Ah, thank you for that, Michael. Well, Michael seems to think that the evoker male with the darkest of the manes was the shire of the three. So, and this guy is he's a little bit shy. I mean, you can see now he's not too concerned. But when he first saw us, he was a little bit a little bit antsy. But who knows? We don't know what's happened to him in the night. We don't know where his brothers are, if it is indeed him. We don't know who he's encountered in the night. And to be a coalition of three and then find yourself on your own, it's not, not the best of things. You know, you feel a bit lonely. Who's going to help you hunt? Who's going to help you fight the Birmingham boys if they materialize? Because he is right where we had them the other day. Or he was anyway, moments before, down by the dam. So there's no doubt there's residual smells of a week ago of the Birmingham's. Not even a week. They were here on Thursday. And I believe today is Monday. So not long ago. But Ralph heard lions calling, which is very interesting. Because if it is indeed, I'm not sure, I didn't hear the call, but if it's a roar, then they are trying to advertise their occupancy of a territory. I walk in the rain, I didn't see any injuries on him. He looks quite good. He looks in very good condition, in fact. I mean, around the face, it almost looks like he's very dirty or wet, but I believe that just might be the makings of his mane. Hard to see right now. Oh, there we go. That's it. 
<laughs> Show's over, folks. <laughs> it is done. <laughs> Craig, I think in all the excitement before, I forgot to introduce myself and you. Is that right? I think I forgot to introduce myself. Well, um, sorry about that. We were so excited to keep up with the mail line. My name is T. Falkenbridge, and I'm joined by Craig on the camera, and this is a mail line. I don't... Okay, well, my, the strap was up earlier, I believe, but it's quite tricky when you, you're waiting for this show to start and the lion is doing nothing. He's in the most perfect position for the camera, and then he decides, as you get the 30-second countdown, to start walking. And you're trying to, um, obviously, start the show with a beautiful shot of a lion, and he was not playing the game. But we got him, we got around the bush, and that obviously led to me forgetting who I was. But that's okay. That's okay. We're obviously going to be joined in a little while by some people very interested to see this mail. But I wonder if any of any of you out there who spent time with us on the show can confirm with me 100% if this is indeed one of the Evoker mails. Send your screenshots through hashtag Safari Live. Jordan, I'm, the evokers are very new to me. I mean, they've only really been in the area the last few months. And um, as far as I'm aware, I haven't focused on their Facebook pages or their profiles to know if they've been alone. But it happens. You know, male lions will often be on their own for a short period of time. Um, but they do try, as, at the best of times, try to stay together. But it's not uncommon to find male lions on their own just for for a short period they get you know a little bit confused or they get uh, they lose each other's way for a day or two and they will find each other again it is in their best interest so it's not uncommon um i mean in the past i've had many many times where i found lone males together um, sometimes what happens is the male maybe finds a female and he starts mating with her and the others move off because what happens in lion coalitions is that um, the first male to find the female is kind of in charge and he will cover her and the other two either follow for three four days watching on in vain or they just leave and that's often what happens and then you'll often find one male on his own trying to catch up with his with his brothers after having a few days of sort of mating time I don't by all means say that that is exactly what's happened but they do get separated but it would be in his best interests, especially while in the heart of Birmingham area, to find his brothers. So it seems as if Ralph is on the search for some cats. Let's go and see how he's doing. Yes, so everyone, so obviously it's very exciting that those lions have been found. But I tell you what, over the last few days I've been rather frustrated because we've had so much sign of leopards, um, you know, and... Of all that signs, uh, it's been very fresh, and we've almost felt like we've been right on their tail, but we've, we've, we've almost been given the slip and driving around in circles for hours. So um, this morning, obviously, that drainage line that I'm talking about is leading a little bit to that area where Steve is, um, so I don't want to bump that sighting just for the minute. But what I am going to do is we're going to head up and see if we can pick up on some fresh signs of Shudulu, um, and then uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that either Tingana and um, Hukumuri are probably in pursuit um, with Shudulu, of course, because it seems like there might be a little bit of mating, a little bit of a love triangle going on there. And uh, if we can't pick up any signs, then we are going to move back and um, finish off with that drainage line that I'm talking about. Because the traffic that is moving through there is, is phenomenal. And um, I've just checked now again at the exit of it. And there's fresh tracks coming out of there. So it seems that is a real highway for these cats. And when we stayed at camp just on that side, we used to sit on the stoop, is what we call it, or the little um, porch. And um, Eggsy, myself, we used to sit there and we saw wild dogs, we saw elephant, we saw leopard all coming right past uh, in that drainage line. So I have a feeling that we might be finding uh, quite a lot of clues that maybe could lead us towards getting a bit more sightings of these elusive cats. <laughs> uh, Samat, leopards are too smart. Thanks for your comment. Um, but 
We've got to keep working hard to try and outsmart them. I want to work out a little bit of a system, see what they're doing, why they're using that route, etc. And uh, I also have a feeling that uh, we might get some clues on the hyenas um, because I always, every single morning, I hear them calling uh, right in that area. So I think there might be quite a bit to learn by going into that drainage line. So, the search this morning goes on for leopards, um, but we're not going to uh, not stop for anything else exciting along the way. Speaking of the search for leopard, David, I hope it's going well to your side. Yes, the search continues for leopards with rough and same case here. Our eyes are glued to the ground and looking for any small sign or any clue that might translate to a leopard having passed somewhere. So we're still on the search also and hoping our luck will be coming very soon. So we have just come out of Rebecca's uh, on, you know, road and we're going to turn left here and VM thinks this is always a very good area for leopards. Again, who knows, eh? Right, VM? And VM is a very big yebo, which translates to yes. Feels very good temperatures now. It has warmed up than earlier from 14 degrees to about 17, which feels a little better for me, eh? Bolton, if we got to your question correct, it's do we have wild dogs where I walked before class? That was the question. Very good, Bolton. Just to let you know, we got lots of wild dogs in the Mara in Kenya where I've walked before. And as usual, very difficult to see them. What happens is the always on the move they move very fast you will see them here and before you try to position yourself on a good angle they are gone they just weave and sneak and on good days you'd see like a pack of 20 30 the last biggest pack i saw of wild dogs was about 50 and we were only lucky because they had a den and they had the young ones there and they stuck in that area for a whole one week so yes we got wild dogs in kenya and again as i said they're always elusive and always very very fast when they move always a great sighting to watch wild dogs the other day we saw four and we were with James and as we tried to get ourselves to a better position to see them, they were gone. Coming up to a nice waterhole here. Let's go to the tree waterhole and find out if there could be anyone. Some bats there, VM. Some lapwings on the edge of the waterhole having a little drink and these are the blacksmith lapwings good job there VM looks like they're two it's one and very good reflection in the water there well done excellent work and again this is the blacksmith lapwing you'll always see them in twos a male and a female because they are monogamous. I'm sure the partner is not very far from here. Yes, well done, well done, Via. There is the partner, picking up on any insects they find around that area. Very, very territorial lap, lap wings, these ones are. And the long feet will allow them, once in a while, to be in and out of water without making their feathers wet. So the other one is just coming close 
to the other one and yeah john i agree with you totally that it is a beautiful word it's a beautiful bird yes most most lapwings john are always very very colorful and uh, you know good looking and sometimes they just wait and look very patient for any movement in the water to get any shrimp or small little insects that could be on the surface of the water also very very patient and the birds have always liked watching and they'll always nest not very far you know, from the water and the, what you call the waterfall or birds that will stay near the water that's where they get most of their food and you see the other one is getting closer to the partner there And again, as I said earlier, they're very, very territorial. They will not allow other birds, or even of the same species, to come to this area. They'll make sure they own it totally. Yeah, but... Steve still got the lions. Yes, we do. Simba, I think it's called in Swahili. One of those words very easy to remember because of the Lion King. And he is, uh, his head has come up a bit sometimes. He's having a bit of a smell in the air. You can see his ears are listening. We do have another vehicle joining us. The process of habituation with cats that haven't seen too many vehicles takes a bit of time. They've got to learn that there's no negative reinforcement that comes from the vehicle following but um, it's not an immediate thing you can see it in the behavior you can kind of see it in his eyes there Matt I'm not sure 100% actually I mean we had the Birmingham's on the property on Thursday I'm gonna have to have a look and see exactly where they are now but I believe that they went all the way back on Friday those two males joined their brothers back down in Mala Mala which is about seven or so kilometers further south they followed the Milwati all the way down after their sort of meanderings up here they went all the way down and joined their two brothers that didn't look like they'd been in any battles the other two uh, that's the last update I heard um, there's a good chance they're hanging around there, but um, if males were calling, maybe the Birmings had come back north again. Uh, maybe it's the evokers that were calling. We know that they were challenging the territorial holders last week on Sunday and on Monday, I think, if I recall. So where exactly they are, it seems like we're having an enormous proverbial game of cat and mouse with the male leopards and the male lions as they seem to be switching out from each other on a regular basis. This goes to show how intricate the dynamics really can be. Jacqueline, I've never heard of a male lion leaving a coalition and then establishing another one or joining another one. Um, you often find nomad males joining the ranks of a new coalition. Um, a bit of a dominance needs to go into that, but I've never known of one to leave a coalition and go to another one. It seems to be that once they form one, that will be their sort of boys band packed for life, so to speak. Um, and then if they if they leave that coalition, I think then that's they're done for. Um, it benefits them to stay in the coalition as long as possible. And obviously they want to pick strong males to be with and they need to match them as well. So it's not uncommon to find male, uh, solo male coalitions, but the chances of them competing and dominating areas are a little bit less uh, than two, three, four. And as the number gets bigger, um, generally three of between four and five, just the strength of those youngsters together um, will be able to breed at an earlier age because um, what happens essentially with the male lions is about the age of three they get ousted from their sort of their home natal territory or natal uh, birthplace and then they get pushed and say there's two or three of them or one of them whatever it might be they'll move 
in search of suitable area and suitable obviously territory for themselves until they are big enough and strong enough to compete but for example in the lion sex ratio it's generally about 50 50 male and female so because lions breed simultaneously or synchronistically you quite often can have a sort of coalitions of three or four maybe five I've had eight well nine they end up being eight and uh, the thing is is that when eight male lions come to three and a half four years of age they will dominate a, ter very, a territory very quickly because there's so many of them um, versus one male who would have to move very very far before eventually either joining a coalition or becoming strong enough to dominate so strength in numbers is very very relevant in lions and if you've ever seen them fight um, it's very difficult for one lion to compete against two, even three. It's just the numbers are just too great. Even if you're a big male, if there's some confidence in you, you can maybe back them off. But a big male versus three, four youngsters, very, very tricky. But we're hoping to see some amazing interaction soon between these big boys. Granny Pig, I'm sure. I mean, he's definitely of breeding age. I'm sure he's looking to mate. But um, I mentioned it earlier that maybe he's found a female and he's lost his brothers that way. But um, by the males claiming territory, by them trying to sort of claim a stake of the Sabi Sands, maybe up here in the north, they're hoping to then encompass the females that are within those areas. So the males actually, their primary objective is to, to protect females within a larger territorial area that they are looking after. And ideally, they want the females to be of reproductive age, and then they will mate with them. If they are not reproductive, often it's because they have got cubs, that's one of the reasons why lions will kill cubs. It brings females into estrus within a month versus two years or so, depending on the age of the cubs, so a very long time. But um, they're definitely trying to um, establish something with them calling. James got them calling. I got them calling as well. Um, someone was calling this morning. Um, they definitely are trying to stake a claim. And as I've said before, if you're a territorial holder, you need to be actively patrolling and looking after that area and I think the Birmingham's have maybe got too much area to look after and so a nice little pocket of it in the north here fits perfectly into the hands of these younger males and from a genetic point of view it's very good new blood new genes Matt, I, I wish I heard lion calls every night. The, the way that my room is structured in the sort of staff buildings there, I don't hear much at night. I, maybe I'm too deep a sleeper, but when I used to live in a tent, I used to hear everything at night. But I didn't hear the calls this morning. Um, did you, Craig? Mm. Craig's next door to me. We didn't hear anything. I heard southern ground hornbills when I woke up, but then I do have a fan on my room, so maybe that's what's preventing it. I think I'm going to stop with my fan and I don't, I'm not going to leave the door open because then the hyena will come in. But um, I don't hear them every night, no. Um, but that's purely because I think of the way our building is designed. But if we stepped outside, I'm sure we'd hear a lot more than we do. Did you hear anything from your building this morning, Kirst? We'll see if Kirst heard anything. See, Kirst didn't. She's in a different building now and I didn't hear anything. But uh, let's go over to Mr. David Gitu and see how his morning is going. Yeah, still a very quiet morning for me, comparing to last night when I had an action-packed uh, sunset game drive. And hopefully, I hope things will start coming back like they were yesterday. Rather quiet. I'm here to make my good contribution today. And uh, there's what sometimes they call the beginner's luck, which was yesterday with all the giraffes or the watogs or the ellies but i believe my beginner's luck is still with me so i've just got some news of some elephants in a particular direction not very far from where we are that is where i'm heading to and again between here and there it could be anything else that you might see on the way and rough got some small antelope Yes, there are small antelope, everybody, and obviously we know that the impala are rutting at the moment. 
but just watch these two silly males. You see what they do? There we go. And they're having a proper go at each other now. I'm not sure if you can hear it. It's not always very loud. Because they are quite far away from us. But what they do is, it's actually, it's crazy. Because they alarm call. So that snort, that's the alarm call. And that's literally making the other one nervous to look around while the one that's given the call can then attack him. But it obviously confuses everybody now, including us at this very uh, time of the year, because we're hearing alarm calls all over the place. And it's mostly these silly males trying to confuse each other, but at the same time confusing themselves and, as I say, us as well. So, confusing time of the year is the rutting season, and the Impala are no less confused. Uh, but we'll keep on the search for the leopards, but we're not going to be using the, lep the, uh, the Impala as a signal uh, ultimately. We need to sit and listen to those alarm calls very carefully uh, to indicate whether they are indeed alarm calls or if they are just rutting. But, uh, a lot of focus going into the, the fighting and and trying to establish dominance between males. You see those two, they're not giving or taking an inch. I often hear them locking horns. It's very loud out in the bush. There's the odd female running around in the background. It's a real standoff. And then you see the one backs up, backs up, and then maybe gives an alarm call, tries to put the other one off with stride, and then has a go at him. And sometimes, as quickly as the fight has begun, uh, they just turn around and uh, the fight is over. Or they can pretend to feed a little bit and sometimes then go back into the, the full fight. And you see those thick necks on them at this time of year is when they're actually in their prime. Lots of muscles bulging out of their neck. And the males do start to look very good, except when they actually establish themselves as a little breeding herd, and then their condition very quickly drops, and they can be looking very scraggly within two or three days as their condition uh, dwindles because of them only worrying about the females, chasing off other males, and they don't drink or, or feed very well at all. So, once again, good natural selection, survival of the fittest, making sure the best genes go through and a good uh, mix of males over each different breeding herd. Wonderful, eh? Never drive past Impala. There's always lots to talk about, lots to see. They're very photogenic. Every different part of the year is also different with the Impala's sociology and so on. And they can very often uh, indicate to us where the leopards are. A wisp wisteria whisper. In that in that situation, it didn't look like they hurt each other, did they? Um, but they can kill each other, and they really—it's almost like they start seeing red. They've got so much testosterone running through their blood. They're still going at it. They can go on like that for weeks. So it's really—it's going to. Uh, you know, sometimes it seems like a small little fight, but they can get quite tired. And I just want to also have a look over on the side here, Davi, uh, as we walk over here. These sites now, these midden sites, are becoming so important at the moment because the males, generally a dominant male, will be starting it. He'll be dropping his, his dung and using the same site every time, also urinating on it. And then, especially if he's got himself a little breeding herd, all the females will come and defecate and urinate in this particular area as well. And then he can come here, sniff the area, use the Fleming Grimace and the Jacobson's organ at the back of his mouth. He's then testing and um, uh, interpreting where all the females are within their cycles. And then he'll know which ones to mate with at which particular day, etc. So this is a very, very important site for them and communication with their whole group system and sociology as well. So, wonderful little midden site. So, from our uh, cafe uh, entree over here in the bush, we're going to head towards these impala um, and try and catch up on some more fresh tracks of leopard. But uh, over to Steve with those lions. 
Mm, the lion had his head up for a moment. He was listening and sniffing to the distance. I don't know how you sniff to the distance, but he was doing something with his nose. He's hearing the male impalas rutting. And he's listening for a contact call from one of his brothers, if there are indeed brothers. Not always coalitions, and coalitions not always made up of brothers. It's, as I said before, sometimes it's a nomad or two that sort of meet up and realize that being friends and hanging out is going to benefit them both. Sometimes it might even be a year apart with regards to the breeding litter within the same pride, and when they get displaced, that's why maybe one male has got a bigger sort of mane than another. Might also be genetics, might be different fathers within the pride that cause the two young males or three young males to look slightly different with regards to mane. But it's still quite fresh this morning, so still ample time for him to be moving. Oh, Panglin, you want to know how much the mane of a lion is? I have no idea, Panglin. I've never thought to weigh the mane. Maybe we should shave him and weigh it. Weigh him and then let it grow back and then weigh him again. What's the best bet? I don't know. I don't know if anyone has ever done that weighed the mane of a lion. I don't think it would be too much. Like, how much does the hair on your head weigh? Well, it seems like Mr. Gitu has found his favorite animal. Yes, my luck from yesterday now is trying to, like, we need you. Here we are. And look at that youngster there. How it was just, you know, munching that cluster leaf tree. My Ellie's, I'm not sure it's the same heart from yesterday, but this could be a different one. And look at the golden light coming through the grass. And this one giving us a very good show for the morning. And yes, I agree, this is my favorite animal all the way since my days of guiding from East Africa. Oh, very good job there, VM. And see how peaceful she is. It's time to grab enough breakfast for the morning. Yeah, it's about seven o'clock. Not a bad time to start eating breakfast now. And we're just surrounded by about 15, 20 alleys where we are. See that one? There's a female in the background there. And one side of the road we've got about five, the other side we've got about fifteen. And what a peaceful morning with this big Ellis. So peaceful. And this is the serenity you get when you come to the wilderness. You see, the big old ones will eat anything, even dry. Yes, Christine, I agree with you. The Ellie's, or the Clint leaves, as they eat there. I agree with you totally, Christine. When young at this age, you, you realize they'll always get the actual green, green, softer, softer grass and the old ones could eat anything, a little bulky, a little dry. So this youngster here, if you look carefully, is only getting grass, plainly grass. Some leaves too. I'm not sure she got the right table manners so as she eats. Osteria, you're asking if I've ever been charged by an elephant. I would say no. What we have learned with time, if you respect their space, they'll also respect you. 
what happens occasionally is when you bump to them or you make a huge mistake of surprising them but i would say all my years of stereo i've been very lucky i've never been charged by an elephant and i hope i will not be charged by one today it's not the best moment of stereo when you get charged by an elephant because they're very very clever especially more the cows you see like this cow very very quickly she came to the calf there and the message could be to us you know i'm the mother here i'm in charge this is my baby i do not want any games and you know we are where we are you can see how relaxed she is as she crosses the road there and like the baby these two boys here david and vm are up to no bad so yeah i'll leave you back catch up with us when you can and all looks good but if that cow would have read something different you'd either see her pushing the baby or let's go let's get out of here i can't trust these guys but oh you know that looks fine it's cow they're following the the mother will pull forward a little bit and see whether you can see the other bigger herd and see what exactly they're doing and we like a vm this morning again with ellis Tom, you, how are you today? And you'd like to know why elephants will eat dry grass sometimes. And elephants eat a lot of food in a day. I would say if I would give you a rough idea of about 200 kilograms say, of amount of food for a fully grown elephant, which may translate to about say 450 pounds. They may need the dry grass to help them in digestion. So that's why once in a while they'll eat some dry grass to help them in digestion. They're not very, very efficient on the food they eat. So they may eat so, so much and only put into good use small amount of that that goes to their body that they internalize or that goes to good use of what they eat so that could be the reason or that's the reason why they'll also eat dry grass to help in the digestion interesting to see how they keep picking the grass straight to their mouth and with any other vegetation they pick together with the grass eh? Lots of different species of, of grass are found here that we do not have in Kenya. The only one I saw that's very similar or is what you have in Kenya is the red grass or the red oat grass. Very, very peaceful, big mammoths. Let's just be trying to look later on today on the early we saw with the pink ears and Ralph got a feathered friend. Well everyone that's what it's all about hey being out on foot and well it's always wonderful to watch the birds especially once we start heading into winter you start seeing the the birds spending a lot of time at the top of branches, especially in the early morning, uh, once the once the the ground starts heating up and uh, uh, putting off a little bit of heat, then you see the birds all on top, also trying to warm up. Uh, you can almost feel their coldness and spreading their wings, doing a little bit of feather maintenance, sometimes calling as well from those perches, but uh, it seems like a quite a routine that starts to happen when. Uh, when, the, when the sun starts uh, rising a bit later and the temperature has dropped a bit in the evenings it's not so hot anymore it's getting rather cold rather cool taking a few hours to warm up in the mornings nice to watch a grey go away bird that we have here and there's nice little crest as well 
Right at the tip of the top of that branch. Now, Matt, very interesting question, that because this bird uh, is one of the birds that does give us an alarm call, and his is like a not always a quee. so we do not particularly trust the go away birds uh, alarm call uh, because they can alarm and sometimes not uh, it, it's really a bit confusing so but um, the ones that we trust the most is a kudu and the nyala if they give that very booming bark that boom, that is almost guaranteed that it's going to be a leopard or a lion. Uh, but, however, with the great go away bird, not so sure. Impala, they can also, as I say, especially now this time of year, rutting season, they're alarming just to confuse each other, uh, and which is what they're doing, and they're confusing us as well. Um, then other animals like the, the spur fowl and the guinea fowl. Um, guinea fowl probably more uh, reliant than spur fowl because they can start to... For, for all sorts of things, you know. Um, but uh, the guinea fowl, once they start to do the, the that when they really start getting going, um, especially when it's in the middle of the day or a few hours after sunrise, a few hours before sunset, uh, because once we get to those hours, they can be calling a little bit just before they go to roost. So that's where it can be a little bit confusing, but out of those hours, they generally then indicating a predator um, but uh, so as I say those impala at this time of year non-reliable um, uh, the best being the kudu and the nyala monkeys also very good very good eyesight um, and they and they give a very good alarm call here yeah, we've got quite a lot closer to this gray go away bird uh, baboons as well they'll also give uh, very good alarm calls as well also very big bark ball and uh, Monkeys, baboons also don't generally alarm call for too much else except predators. However, monkeys, they can give a lot of calls for birds of prey as well as snakes. Um, so the ultimate being kudu. If a kudu barks, head in that direction immediately as that great go away bird flies off. And he was very relaxed. There was no alarm calling from him to say the least. So, and we've got no fresh tracks on the road for now. So we're actually just... Uh, we're just trying to pick up and see if we can get any signs. We're listening out the whole time as we go, not for those pesky impala alarm rutting calls. But um, So the predator search is still on the move. Uh, at, at least Steve has been with some lions, but it seems David has got some big animals of another kind. Right, the predator is going on the move. Our big mammals are still here and the ellies have not gone anywhere and they are feeding and munching and trying to devour all the grass and the vegetation around here. So the herd has now come together. Most of them are all closely together. I'm not sure there's something of interest they got where they are. Gemma, good morning or good evening, and your question is, what has been my most memorable encounter with elephants? I say that was sometimes I was in Tanzania where we had a baby elephant inside a hole, which accidentally I think, uh, you know, a hole just caved in. You know, because, you know, Ellie's, I mean, babies are also heavy, and the mother didn't know, and it took... A, a combination of two cows to get that baby out and you'd have seen all the method all the science all the plants and you know they put in place the mechanism to lift that baby up and on two occasions when the baby was just about to be out of the hole it slid back and I had a guest who laughed and I wasn't very impressed by that and on a second attempt the baby also went right inside so what we did we pulled back a little bit uh, where we were packed and comfortably these two cows got that baby out and you'd have seen that baby rolling you know out of joy having been brought out of danger because 
uh, she could have been attacked inside that hole by hyenas or lions or anybody else. Yeah, that was a memorable encounter I had, I would say, with Ellis, Gemma. Yes, Castro says, yes, that sounds amazing, but it's quite something when you see the intelligence of these animals and when the first, I would say the mother is the one who started to get the baby out and when it could not, I think a sister or a cousin came in to give her a hand and it worked magic, you know. I'm not sure I still have that clip of uh, that interesting show somewhere, but it was quite something. Very, very clever animals, Eliza. See those two there throwing their trunks in the air. And all the bushes around here are the magic nguari. All the green bushes you see around here are what you call the magic nguari. And they're very, very popular with Ellis. Back home in the village where I come from, we have used them to make homes. And also when we slaughter, when you have celebrations like weddings and we slaughter a goat, we'll always use them to put under and so that they can, you know, take all the intestine on all the internal organs of the goat so that it doesn't spill all over. Ellis will eat them too, and they are also very good for beating fire. The magic green, magic ngwari green trees or bushes you see around those Ellis there. How beautiful to have such great light on a morning with Ellis, eh? I've been trying to think which could be the matriarch here in this herd of Ellis. Yes, Cassie, I agree with you. Casty in full control. She's enjoying this sighting too. However tired one would be when you got Ellie's on a sighting, you'll never go to sleep. The male lions are still keeping Steve busy. You are 100% right, David. The elephants are always very exciting to watch. They're always busy. Busy, busy, busy. Whereas lions are very flat. Like this is often what you see with cats. If they're not up and doing something, they are lying down and taking what we call a cat nap. He's moved his head once since you were last with us. And then he put it back down again, so invigorating. But nonetheless, we are still with him, and he's enjoying his solitude. Corbett, it's a good question. Um, it's difficult to actually say how far a young male lion will travel away once it's left its natal sort of home. It really depends on, on the lion itself and how big the coalition is. They can go 100 kilometers more, perhaps. So basically, they'll move from one territory or one pride area to the next and to the next and to the next, being chased by the dominant males in those areas until they are eventually old enough and big enough and strong enough to secure their own territory, by which stage they've become quite successful hunters. They've probably been in a number of scraps as well, maybe not too serious, but maybe a couple of proper fights. And they've learned a, bit, a little bit more about the way to be a male lion, and then they can exert dominance. So the whole purpose is to get far away from your sisters and your mother, to avoid inbreeding, but how exactly, how far exactly, it's difficult to say. I mean, they could go to the other side of the Kruger Park and then get big enough and then come all the way back and then claim this area. That's not unheard of, I suppose. But the objective is for them to move away. The dispersal effect, they call it. You see a very similar behavior in birds, except it is the female. In raptors, it is the female that generally moves away. And the young males often carve out a territory in their parents' sort of homelands.
Now, these guys came from the Timavati in the north, which is probably about 40, 40, 50 kilometers, maybe less. And grommet male lions are in their prime between about four and a half and eight. Um, after eight, they start getting a little bit older, but they're still, if they're in a coalition um, and they've battle scarred like the Birmingham boys, then they're at a very good strength, size, and sort of technique as well. I mean, it's not just about being strong. There's definitely technique. Um, there's definitely a sort of a, 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 what's the word, a confidence level. I mean, you can see the Birmingham boys, it's just they're exuding confidence, they're sort of drooling testosterone as they move around. But sort of male lions are in their prime between four and a half and eight, eight and a half, and that's generally the time uh, when male lions will dominate a pride. Normally, on average, in the Kruger Park, they reckon male lions will have a pride tenure of about four, four and a half years. And obviously, the larger the coalition, uh, the longer that can stretch for. But when you go back to it and realize that if a female, if these males, for example, they take over a territory nearby and they have females in it that have cubs and the females, and they don't kill the cubs, it can take two years before they reproductively have any offspring in the population, which is half of the average pride tenure. So that is why one of the major reasons for lions killing cubs but we are probably going to leave this very flat lion soon and go off in search of other wonderful things and someone who's in search of wonderful things already let's go and see how ralph is doing well everyone there's nothing um fresh uh, of uh, signs of shodulu just yet what we do have we've got some crown lap wings they're making a, a, a big racket all around us here um, that's one of the alarm calls that we could also listen out for but at the moment i think they're probably alarm calling for us um, and another one that we often get our position given away by um, are egyptian geese you see, they will, they will fly in a particular direction, and as they come just near to you like this, they'll be going, ka, 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 and they make this huge racket, giving away your position, uh, which is terrible. And so at the moment, we've got these uh, crowned lapwings, which are making a terrible racket, and Shudulu, that female leopard that we're following, or trying to look for, um, and uh, have been following quite recently, she, it seems, whenever there's alarm calls near to her, like the Impala, giving their uh, sort of rutting, pa, 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 but once they start doing that near to her, she just gets up and runs off, um, and doesn't give them a chance to carry on about it, because uh, it's obviously also irritating for her, giving away the position that she's been in, and uh, sort of indicating to everybody else in the area that there's a, there's a, there's a leopard or a potential predator. So, uh, for us, also pretty much wanting to run away from these ground lapwings at the moment, and also trying to avoid those Egyptian geese any time you're near to water, and because uh, it just gives away your position. So it's very quiet now. For now, we haven't heard any alarm calls, except for the impala rutting all over the place. But what do we do if we uh, want to see an animal in the bush? We need to think about uh, being like that animal. So Shudulu, she likes standing up on top of Shudulus or termite mounds. Let's also go up there and have a look from here. Nice vantage point it is. Now, Ramit, good question. What does it feel getting close to giraffe on foot? It can be an absolutely amazing experience. And what I've done with a few of my students uh, quite regularly is um, we get them to roll on the ground. Because I'm sure the giraffe knows what these animals are on two legs. And they're quite wary of them, quite scared of them. But as soon as you put people on the ground, lie them flat and roll on the ground towards the giraffe, they are totally perplexed. And they all come and stand over that person, literally trying to work out what in the world this rolling massive animal is. And uh, we've had some wonderful encounters uh, taking photos of giraffe from literally underneath them. Totally wild giraffe as well. And their curiosity just gets the better of them. All of them start moving in. And the one trying to see a little bit closer than the other, they're almost climbing over each other's shoulders trying to see what is this weird thing on the ground. So for me, giraffe can be 
awesome on foot uh, because they can be a little bit curious but if you just walk directly towards them they do generally get a little bit scared and run away so if there's a giraffe here you try and just cut across the animal because it's like one of those things if you walk directly towards a person immediately you're like well, what do you want, you know? Because he's coming directly at you, you feel uh, engaged immediately. But if somebody's walking diagonally across from you and just looking at you from the side, you're like, your sort of behavior to that person changes. Then you're almost on the front foot. So that's why we try and put the animal, uh, in that case the giraffe, on the front foot that he can feel um, quite uh, confident. Obviously, we don't want to do that with dangerous animals potentially dangerous. In that situation, we want to try and put them on the back foot a little bit so that they're thinking they don't want to attack you. So there's those various different techniques that we use when we're um, walking, and it's sometimes very subtle, just like that. But um, still, we're not seeing anything from up here. I think Herbie headed in that direction there. We need to try and catch up with him, not let him get too far ahead of us, uh, especially if he's finding any fresh tracks of leopard. But very quiet now. The sun's getting up nicely. Uh, Gemma, well, there's, there's a number of different uh, guide training institutions in South Africa, and you can look them up online, and who knows, I might be one of the, one of the instructors for one of those different courses. I work for uh, a number of different uh, training institutions, but um, at the moment, this is what I'm going to be sticking with. So I'll be talking to you uh, on Safari Live uh, for the foreseeable future, but there are some wonderful institutions that you can go and uh, have a look to train to be as a guide. Right. As we search on here, I want to see if we can find anything else exciting. Hopefully I can find you a giraffe and maybe I'll exhibit exactly what I was talking about. But um, it seems Steve, I don't think he's found anything just yet, but let's go and see. Right, talking of giraffes, this is the area I saw the big tall giraffe yesterday that had a big scar right there on the neck and they just slant out later on last night it must have been a fight it was involved in with another male and as I said yesterday we have like uh, the species of the giraffe is different from what you have in Kenya here we got the southern giraffe well in Kenya we got the Maasai giraffe I'd be happy to see that giraffe again and get a closer look and try and explore why that huge work it had on the neck it must have been a very big one eh? Sorry, there's a car coming right there meeting us now they're there friends of ours and I'd be more than happy to find out if I'd be able to see that giraffe again and know why that one was so huge Internet. Your question is, do I have family back in Kenya and do they watch Safari Live? Yes, I do. Got a family somewhere near Nairobi city. That's the capital city of Kenya. And they watch Safari Live every day. Every day. And when they miss it, they'll always replay it on YouTube. I hope tonight you do the same, eh? And before joining Safari Live, I have been watching it for the last two years. It's great drive when they bring you, you know, live shows or live game drives in real time. They're doing something, you know, nobody else has ever been able to do in this world. Great stuff. So the day the kids will not go to school, they'll be glued, especially Saturday and Sunday, before they go to church on Sunday, on the screens like this watching. And I'm sure, I can tell you, they are watching me right now. Eh? And that makes me feel, yeah, soon becoming a superstar. Eh? All 
right, so we'll see, hope to see giraffes or alleys or anything else that will come our way this morning. Feels very good now, unlike earlier when it was very, very cold. And maybe I might end up going to my favorite waterhole. Big part there, VM, I don't know if you can see it on the tree line there. Just one minute, I'll see if you can get one bird on the, the smart bush, right? What do you think? Let's see if we, it's right, you see it on, right there, on top there? Let's see. Yeah, the bird on top. Yeah, let's see how the VM can get it. It looks like the magpie shrike to me. What do you think? See that beautiful bird? They've got a long tail. Let me get my bird book very quickly. I know. It looks like a magpie shrike. Yeah, there's a magpie shrike there. VM confirmed to me. Thank you very much, VM. I just guess a shrike. And we also got them in East Africa, the magpie shrikes. With the characteristic hook to beaks when they go for the grasshoppers or locusts, they'll catch and patch them up on thorns. Beautiful face, they're just turning in good light. You can see them on wire lines and sometimes patched up high in the bushes looking down to see whether there could be an insect flying and it will go down and catch it. Excellent. In flight they always very, they look very colorful when you see them flying. Oops, just changed position. Still looking down there I'm sure to find out of any movement and this most likely could be a male. Males normally tend to have very long tails unlike the females. You can hear guinea fall in the background. Do you think there's something that's looking on the ground there? I don't know what uh, should be looking for but they normally eat lots of insects we we'll try and turn around and hear some calls we're getting from a distance there like squirrel alarmings and find out if there's anything happening there or not. Steve, we've got some impalas now. Yes, they're nowhere near as dangerous as that male lion. But a nice little breeding herd of females here, just sort of mingling in around the vegetation. We've left the one of Oka male. He was lying up. He wasn't being too exciting, so we thought we'd come out and find some more content. And here is a small herd of impala. And the tracks of that male lion are on the road we are now headed towards the dam. There was a place where he lay down, so no doubt he passed this area. And I'm sure where we found the tracks of him lying on the ground is probably where he was maybe calling to try and find his brothers and no doubt these impala are aware that male lions have been moving through and they live in a constant state of sort of attention as they mingle in their large herd I can't see a male anywhere Rixus, yes, impalas are very good meat uh, very good chops, very good, uh, I don't know about fillet Oh, and a daker just joined from the other side. You didn't see him. There goes another one. Wow. Just two dakers. They've just scared the life out of these impala. <laughs> two daker come bounding through. Yes, impala's a very good game meat. It's not too venison like. I mean, if you've ever had uh, game meat or venison, it's not very strong. It's actually very, very tender. Uh, it's not as rich as lamb, and it's nowhere near as sort of what would you say the word is harsh as some some venison can be a very tasty meat and impala are by by you know by every measure method me, excuse my words impala are by no but they are the most important animal species out here as a food resource for leopard lion 
wild dog most def certainly and then cheetah as well they do enjoy not just the flavor but the abundance of them there's always a lot of impala around and these females seem to be without a male maybe they have moved out of his little area his his wonderings and his suggestions all night his chorus those of you who have not been watching the show will not be aware that the male impala are in a full rut at the moment the females are in the breeding status and Ralph was showing you some males fighting not so long ago so it's always interesting to see a group of females just chilling out a bit and having a bit of a, a meal without being constantly herded left and right by the dominant male surprised we haven't heard him yet he's very vociferous We are headed sort of south now, we're going to see if we can, if there's any other activity of the two other males, male lions, joining the brother. Maybe will Krager in the road straight up ahead. Oh, it's gone. Sorry, maybe the next one will come back. But the Dacre just snuck across the road again. It's very hard to get them on camera. Two went across the frame before and now one, but now they're alone again. So let's see if we can find any activity or signs of these other two male lions. And then we'll also see whatever other tracks have been up and down patrolling. So as always, we'll check the water points and the areas of interest. Nicola, no, in pollen at Margatory, they're what we'd call quite sedentary. In fact, they like to spend time in the same area and they're never too far away from water. And this time of year, the male impala have got small little territories or leks for the females to move through for mating. And then um, they don't go very far. I mean, they will stay in pretty similar areas to where they are. They might expand, but they don't do a migration like the wildebeest in the Mara do. And they cover enormous distances. They stay pretty much the same sort of area. But they might move around a bit, but no means is that a migration. All migrations down in the Kruger Park have been thwarted by a fence that was put up in the, I think the 40s a veterinary fence to prevent wildlife mixing with the domestic cattle uh, disease corridors and that prevented the the annual migration of zebra and wildebeest and others that used to go up to the high felt and come back again but those records are almost all sort of gone anyway on that note we are going to keep heading south and see what we may find on our way. I haven't seen a leopard track yet this morning. We haven't gone very far, to be honest. We got as far as the dam to find that male le that male lion. What a glorious start it was indeed. So Craig and I have avoided the coldest times of the morning when we're driving. It's almost time to take a jacket off now, isn't it, Craig? Eh? When the temperatures are 14, 15 degrees Celsius, then quite often when you're moving through the air here, it is very cold. But when you're sitting at a static sighting with the male lion, that's actually very comfortable, especially if you've brought coffee along like I did. And uh, I was very, very disappointed when Craig said he doesn't like coffee. I wasn't disappointed. It just meant more coffee for me. I'm just going to check these little pans in here, Craig, because um, those Dacre came bolting out of here like there was something on their tail. Okay, well, while we keep driving on, let's go and see who's on Bushwalk. Well, it is me, Ralph Kirsten, and I tell you, um, it is been a little bit slow this morning uh, especially after the last few days where we had almost tracks coming out of our ears they were all over the place um, but it's good now to consolidate once again we can let those tracks age a little bit and uh, at least now once we get some fresher tracks once more we'll be able to identify that they are nice and fresh it would almost be very nice if we could have a little bit of a sprinkling of rain and um, that would just clear everything up give us a nice clean slate and then we could start nice and nice and fresh again 
Um, and I did say a little bit earlier there were some male lions. I did mean uh, I didn't mean to uh, putting that into plural. I think uh, I didn't realise that old Steve had only one of the avoca males. Now that's quite interesting because while we've been walking, we've been chatting with Herbie, the game scout. Um, and he thinks that uh, those Birminghams have had a, a real run-in with the Avoca males, who have literally quite um, uh, possibly stood their ground very well, because it seems that the Birminghams have come off really knowing that they've been in a fight. Um, the only thing is, is that the Avocas have now split. Those, the two males have, have been chased, and this one male now, he's around, but it seems as a, as a result of this conflict between the Birminghams and the Avocas. Um, but, so, you know, my thoughts were is that the Avocas were going to get absolutely hammered uh, because of their age and their inexperience and their maturity, but it seems like they've actually done really well. Um, they've landed up giving uh, a couple of those um, Birmingham's uh, a black eye, a little bit of cuts and, and uh, injuries on, the, on their back. And when we saw Nene and Tinho, I think it was Tinho that had the black eye, and I think it might have been Nene that um, had uh, the injury on his, on his hind rump. But you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I know it was those two. Um, so it would be interesting to see how the two males of the Avokas have fared. Uh, but nonetheless, they have definitely um, uh, sort of made their presence felt. And the Birminghams then were very quiet after that. There was no roaring. Um, and so... That, for me, was quite strange. They didn't announce that their, uh, their battle had been won. They were very quiet after the battle. And now, this morning, having this evoker calling, it's almost like they're still um, challenging for this territory. So, I don't think that, that that war is over just yet. I think the battle might have been won by whichever side, maybe possibly the Birminghams, but I think the injuries and the toll might uh, be a bit heavier than what we think, because maybe these evokers have won just a little bit of a mental battle, and uh, that they could maybe regroup and realize that uh, they've got potential to take this thing uh, from, from the Birminghams. So very interesting to, to note that. Uh, Romit, uh, I don't know except, uh, anyone except um, Crocodile Dundee that can sort of hypnotize animals. And, uh, well, that being on television, uh, a little bit far-fetched. I know he did something with a, with a buffalo, you know, putting it to sleep like this. Um, putting lions to sleep just with eye contact. Um, I don't know of anybody that can, that can do that or has done that. But that's not to say that it's not possible. Um, I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, anything's possible, and Kirsty's saying that maybe I should try. Well, I'll definitely try it first when we're out in the vehicle, um, and then I'll see uh, what the result is. Maybe I'll take some catnip with me, uh, just to help in that hypnosis process, um, and then try it later on foot again. And yes, thanks Kirsty. I suppose I shouldn't blink while I'm trying that hypnotic uh, procedure, but uh, otherwise... Uh, I think it might be a little bit precarious. So as we continue on here now, looking for any sign or clue of Shudulu slash Hukumuri slash Tingana slash Hosana, uh, let's head on over to David. Maybe he can help us out. Yes, everybody now is out looking for tracks of these elusive leopards as they are normally and I have decided now to go to the block where we think Tandy always hangs around. Of course she also moves a lot but VM tells me we have a better chance and he feels in his heart we might be lucky to see Tandy this morning. So this is not the direction we are going into. I'm not sure very well that's where maybe she gave birth to Talalamba but that's the direction we are going into and see if we might be lucky to see her. I've seen her once, I'd be happy to see her again and maybe have my own fast sighting out on a solo drive. Eh? 
not trucks as yet, full tamba. Sharon, your question is, what has been my scariest moment as a guide? Well, a few, but the one most scariest one is where we had elephant surrounding the car and they could not move. They didn't move, we didn't move, the car's engine was switched off, we were not talking, I was all quiet and they held us ransom for a whole five minutes five minutes and to me that was a scary moment Sharon because we do not know what wrong we had done to the elephant and we did not know what to do the radio was off and it was just a quiet moment for a whole five minutes and they decided to leave and I was left with more questions than answers what would have happened if they would have decided to tip over the car which they have done a few times. VM, don't you think that roller up there is beautiful bad to look in the morning? I don't know what you think, VM. The, what, the, the roller on top of that tree there. It's the right up. Come on, where did you go? That's a crimson. Do you want me back up a little bit? Yes, Cassie, I agree with you. It's a beautiful bird. Did you have another one? Beautiful bird just took off when we're just framing it. Let me see if we can see whether it went to the other tree there. Do you think so? On that tree right there, VM to the right of it. See whether they can get hold of it. Well done, VM. Rollers are the same ones here, like also what we see in East Africa and this is the lilac breasted roller and I don't know where that came from in Kenya I found out the other day it's the national bird of Kenya and we're talking about it James I personally have never heard of that before but yes for the lion I know that's the national animal of Kenya but for the bird I saw some notes saying the national bird of Kenya is this bird here the lilac breasted roller which also happens to be the national bird of Botswana but the good thing I know is, of all the birds I've seen, of all the bird species, this is my favorite bird. I've said that many times, and it will continue to be my favorite bird. Very, very difficult to tell males from females. Their sexual dimorphism is very different. Yes, Gemma, you say is also your favorite bird. I agree with you 100%, and I'm sure you have seen it many, many times. Very, very true there, Gemma. It is. I mean, when you look at all the different colors on that bird comparing to other birds of the same size, Gemma, I mean, it got beautiful colors, eh? Hmm. All right, we'll move on and see whether we might see more of it. And as I was saying before, it's very difficult to tell male from female. They don't have a very clear sexual dimorphism. Unlike other birds that you tell a male from a female just like that. So heading to the block where VM think we might be lucky to see Tandy with her young cub. And how exciting it will be for me to spot my first leopard on my own, on a driver. We are looking under every bush, grass, trucks on the road, and Steve is rolling. Well, we haven't found any tracks. I'm loving hearing David on the radio, or on, on air, all his little stories. Held ransom by elephants. <laughs> I was out with him the other morning and just giving him some heads up on elephant behavior because he spent a lot of time with them in the Mara. But in the Mara they are pretty relaxed, you know, they see so many vehicles. So it's nice and important for him to understand the sort of idiosyncrasies that go with how a f female or a male is reacting or how their behavior might change. So it was wonderful to spend time with him like that and he's 
so receptive to all the new information that's coming forward which is great but he brings with him as well an enormous amount of stuff so great to have David on the team and indeed a gentleman a true gentleman okay so here is a track of a male lion just move it like this for you Craig eh? let me try and get the light the vehicle is now playing games can you get that one Craig eh? can you get this one Now that is an enormous footprint. We've spent a lot of time with the Unkuhuma females and we see their tracks. Have you got it, Craigie? And you can see it's quite fresh from this morning. Walking quite quickly though. Here's his other foot and there's the other foot walking in this direction. You can clearly see the one, two, three, four toes and look how wide it is. It's almost as wide as it is long. Whereas in, in lionesses, it's often quite sort of narrow. But also, where the back pad is there, look how wide the toe is. It's almost an entire finger or thumb on the outside. That just goes to show you the size of these guys. Whereas the females are a lot narrower. That outside toe doesn't extend out as much. And if I just put my hand here, you'll get an idea of the size. Look at that. And those are really essentially just his fingers because <laughs> the, the hand extends a little bit up onto so the wrist in the lion. But marvelous. I'll just double check if these are the same tracks of that one male and maybe if we get two then we'll know there's a second male around. But at the moment it seems like it's just one. This is the road we were coming down from that side. It's possibly he's coming from this side and he's walked that way. But we'll keep scratching around and see what we can see. Just one track at the moment. Poor guy looking for his his brothers, I suppose. So maybe it was him calling to say, where are you? Where are you? I didn't hear it myself, so I can't say. OK, let's go back this way around, see if we get a second track. I love finding male lion tracks, I really do. There's just something about them. Finding them, the animal before the track though is always a bit strange. Oh, Malaika? <laughs> no, Malaika, a predator has never rubbed themselves against my leg while in the vehicle. I have had a leopard come very close to sniffing my shoe though. Exactly like this, no door came under the car and then looked at me and then tried to sniff my shoe. Um, I'm not going to lie and say that I was very comfortable with that, but um, it happened. Okay, so. So, male lions going this way still. There's also some tracks of, of that buffalo bull heading back that way. Maybe we'll turn around. Maybe his brothers. Are on the buffalo that grumpy old man okay so there's only the one track here of that one male headed directly towards where we had him so we can assume that that is him we can assume that's him and he's come in from the east he's come in from from the back there from Mamba the road where I was on last night looking for any signs of the little chief Hosanna There's a Franklin alarm calling up ahead. Let's go have a look. Let's go have a look. I walk in the rain. The reason we count the, t the toes in the track is there are viewers out there watching, sometimes for the first time, that don't know what we're looking at. See, Franklin is on top of the branch here. Yeah? This is what they do when there's something dangerous nearby. A 
Are you going to stop shouting now? See, when you hear a Franklin alarm calling and then you find them on the floor, it means that there's nothing going on. But when they alarm call and they jump in the tree like that, that's a means of getting away from the predator. You got him, Craig, eh? Okay, now he's, now he's chilling out again. Did you see me, young Franklin, and you freak out a bit, or are you reminiscing of the male lion that walked past here a couple of hours ago? There's a second one below him there, so it doesn't seem that there's anything going on. Franklin are normally very, very reliable, and that's quite disappointing. So, I walk in the rain, we count the toes, because quite often people are looking at what we're looking at, and they don't actually see what we see. So, it's good to count the toes, so you can get a perspective of where, because if I show you the toes on a foot, you can see, oh, that's the front, and the back pad is the back. But some people don't see what you see, so it's important to try and explain it. For me to just show you a track and say, look at that. You... And, and Kirsten says, so I don't forget how to count. I do struggle. I, I get up to 10 and then I struggle. But if I, and I had this once, very, very interesting. I had this once with uh, some French guests and I showed them a porcupine track, but they didn't know what a porcupine is. And I'm trying to explain the track to them for a few minutes and they didn't know what a porcupine was. So first of all, they need to know what the animal looks like. You all know what a male lion looks like. If you don't, we saw one earlier. And then to try and point out a foot track on the ground when you don't know what something looks like is very, very difficult. But as soon as I understood, I said porcupine, and eventually we understood that the French word is porcupig. I don't know how they didn't get that from my English. But anyway, um, so that helps people to see what you see. You can never assume that everyone out there watching knows what's going on or has seen it before so it's important to point it out and because you've been on the show you've probably seen it all the time so it's important for us to just point it out and that's why i said it's not the whole hand because the fifth toe on the line is up here on sort of what we call the dew claw so it's a little bit further up on the wrist that's why the line all you're seeing is that on the track and the thumb is actually up here so that's why we count it and maybe one day there'll be a five track toed lion that we will see and that will be one for the books well let's go to Ralph and see what tracks he might have scratched around for well being out on bushwalk Steve you know just as well as I do that uh, this is the best place to be to be looking at tracks uh, we're, we're on the on foot on the ground and we're able to get up nice and close and personal with it with a vehicle is a bit sporadic you have to jump off every now and then and also trying to look from a quite a high uh, distance down on the track now a little track here that um, we often see in the mornings on the road and and we also use it as a very good indicator of sort of time frame and when did the leopard last walk here etc and we look at these to use that these little tracks in here now, there's one there. You can see it nice and close. And likes what Steve's doing. Very good to count the toes. One, two, three, four. At least you're working out exactly what animal this is. Um, but then we've got another second proximal pad there behind that one. That is obviously where the back foot has stepped over the front foot, which is pushed down over there. But with this little... This little cat-like animal, we often see this little dot at the back of it there, which is um, pretty much at the part of their hand that uh, normally comes up off of the ground. But uh, when, they, when they step into the track, you often get just that little impression there. Um, and that there it is again. You see it over there? So this is a very clear track of a genet lesser uh, or small spotted or large spotted one of the two the more common of the two is the small spotted but they're very much the same size just slightly different color pattern uh, color pattern on them and remember i'm going to exhibit it again to you but if we go from uh, the one foot to another foot of the same so right foot to right foot um, on a normal walking pace we can work out body length so the body length of this animal was pretty much that length there if I put my hand next to it so a very a very short a very small little animal there so just to try and put it into perspective this animal was probably about 
that high off the ground, nice long tail, and so we just try and get the whole picture. Now, I just want to indicate to you, I have done this before, but for anybody that didn't see it, at a normal walking pace, let me do it over here on the road, there I make my line. Okay, I just need to clear these tracks here. That was our game scout, heading up in front, Herbie. Okay, now if I stand here, and I walk on a normal walking pace, left, right, left. There's, because I started on my left foot, did I? No, I went left, right, left. So, left foot to left foot, there it was there. Okay, now let me lie down. Am I pretty close? There's my shoulder. Yeah, see that? Pretty much my body length, all right? So, it works for all these animals. There you can say my body length. That's quite big, but obviously we then need to turn it up on two legs. So, and that's a good way to get an impression of exactly the size of the animal that you're looking at and get closer to a bit of an answer there. So, that's very good to look at. And as we look a bit closer here, we've got all sorts. Here is a track of a warthog. See how it's very almost box-like. We've got two toes and it was heading that way, very much the deepest point of the track in the front of it. Also a bit of a direct register. There was the front foot and the back foot stepped into it over there. So, you know, that can often put you off, that little extra part, but because that back foot's gone into it. So this is a warthog track, very square, sort of boxy shape to it. Whereas over here, we've got a different animal. It's got a bit of a V to it, and widest part all the way up at the back. This is an impala, not part of the Tragolophenes. So that means that he's not a direct register. There's one foot there's another foot, there's another foot. He doesn't put his front foot down and his back foot go directly into it on a normal walking pace. Sometimes it can obviously happen depending if they're just mulling around, etc. So don't be confused. But Nyala and Impala can very easily be confused. But if you look at them in a normal walking pace, um, uh, Impala won't direct register. So very easy to eliminate Impala or Nyala if uh, one or the other. So very interesting, isn't it? And that's the beauty of tracking. We can find out so much of it. And come and have a look here. It looks like we've got some kind of harvest ants. And they've made themselves what looks like to be a bit of an ant highway. See how they've cleared out all the stones on this track here? And making it a lovely runway from this hole here to possibly a bit of a bigger one uh, over there but I wonder we often see them moving around uh, especially once it's rained sometimes I think the one hole gets waterlogged uh, or very wet um, or possibly even uh, whatever they're doing under the ground there's a problem associated with the rain with the water coming in the hole so then they do shift a little bit um, but very interesting I love how they make these these tracks, um, and we used to watch the safari ants in in Kenya, and they make these. Geez, they make it so quick, but within about three or four hours, they've got these uh, hundreds of meters worth of these um, sort of ant highway type things. They've shifted everything out the way, and they've also treaded it that it's really compact and and smooth in that zone. So. Uh, very very interesting now I think we need to continue on and see if we can get some fresh tracks but we're looking down on the ground it seems like David's looking up in the sky <coughs> yes and uh, I've been trying to compare the world of trees or doing a bit of uh, botanical work around here and looking at the trees that we have here in South Africa and the trees that would ring a bell to the trees you know we got in Kenya and this is one of them and this is the buffalo thorn 
and same size, same colors, same shape of horns, same color of the back. We have the buffalo thorn here in South Africa that I found when we also got it in Kenya. Second one here, and it's very similar to what we call the magic Ngoare, but I think this is the Natal one and they're almost similar in the same form, but the leaves, these ones are a bit wavy comparing to the ones for the magic Ngoare. So these two trees here have taken me right back home, the buffalo thorn and the Natal Ngoare. This one we definitely don't have in Kenya and I've been told by VM this is the lead tree and it's very very slow in growing. I don't know what I would compare it with back home in Kenya this tree here. Uh, I'm trying to imagine I should be able to know what it closely relates to or it could be similar to but nothing like this the lead wood and I don't know whether they lose the leaves during winter here or not because the trees we have in Kenya will keep their leaves all around the year in general. So I got two trees to take me home, this one here and that one. Let me see if I'll get more trees that are very, very similar or I'd compare. I've been doing a lot of parallels of the animals here and the animals in East Africa. Now today, being a rather quiet morning, I'm doing a parallel of the trees. Right, back in the car. So doing trees and at the same time going on searching for the leopards at the same time. My big thing would be to see Tandy. Robert, hi and your question is, what is my favorite snake? Ah, favorite snake, seeing, playing with, <laughs> I would say the black mamba. Black mamba because to me they're some of the most intelligent snakes we got around. So Romet, your question being what's my favorite snake, I would say black mamba because I think black mambas are very very intelligent snakes comparing to the other snakes. That's what I think. I could be wrong, but I've found out how they raise their young ones, how they behave. They're very, very intelligent snakes. And see what we came into again. And more Ellie's right there. He's right in the middle of the road. I was speaking earlier of a situation where I was surrounded by Ellis and now here I am blocked by two Ellis. It's a fox drongo, foxtail drongo, which was jumping up there trying to hook on some insect. So I think the mother has given way and the young one, the youngster, is still put on the road there. I think my Ellie's are coming back again to entertain me. You see the foxtail drongo jumping up and down on the road. A smaller heart than what we had before. Sorry, cast it. Come again. Very good, very good. Yes, they'll sometimes hook on insects for tail drongo, cast it just like the bee eaters. Just catch them in the air, you know. See one coming towards us, coming to say hello. Good morning, keep coming, keep coming. Maybe VM is familiar to you, maybe I'll introduce myself and tell you all the good things, you tell me all the good things about South Africa and I'll tell you the good things about East Africa. But any day I see Ellie's is a good day for me.
Keep coming this way. Come say hello to us. Lara, yes, you say you enjoy seeing elephants. And I can tell you, me too, Lara. And, you know, elephants will always keep you going, entertain you throughout the day. And you can spend as long as, as long time as you can with Ellis. There's a young one there coming to us. <laughs> He's such a joker, just playing with us here and enjoying VM's lens. And this other one here, VM, is coming to say hello right to us. Let's see what she does. She's trying to investigate. Looking. Sorry about that. Looking again. It's very close. She's fine with us. We are fine with her. And she said, thank you, David and VM, for behaving well. Hope you picked that. And slowly she is making her way to join the rest of the herd. Again, safety numbers. Nobody wants to be alone in this thicket. Beautiful. is exciting eh? Ellie's have been with us from yesterday this morning another herd of elephants and now we'll make a move to see whether we're gonna get our trophy of Tandy thank you Ellis good stuff eh? great temperatures now warming up I have one leon Steve has an update for us. Oh, well, not a huge update. Um, we just had African hawk eagle in the nest fly off, so they are still breeding. But they don't like to be caught on camera, it seems. Often a pair would be around, but maybe it's still early stages. Maybe they're still building the nest. Because if there was an egg on there, there would definitely be one in the nest incubating. Nicola, the largest bird of prey, I'm thinking, I'm guessing it's going to be the Marshall Eagle, but then you do get vultures that are bigger, but you don't really call vultures birds of prey, even though they do fall sort of underneath a similar category so the leopard face would be the biggest vulture very closely behind by the the cape vulture but then the marshall eagle is the biggest that i am aware of uh, and they are enormous and beautiful and i can show you a picture if you like we've got the hawk eagle there they're quite small i think i can hear is that david no it's not david that's texan other other game viewers Okay, let me find you a quick martial eagle. Martial in for the term war, eh? Hey? Martial. Just show you a beautiful photo. How's that, Craig? As I bend him back. The yellow eye, similar to a snake eagle. That crest on the back of the head. The spots on the chest. And look at the size of their feet, 81 centimeters, 4 kilograms. I'm thinking it is the largest raptor in South Africa. Am I wrong? Maybe someone out there can tell me if I'm indeed wrong. But what I wanted to show you on the map, um, where we actually had those tracks of the male lion, I was a bit mistaken. So on Twin Dams Road, we were just there. I said Mamba, in fact, it was actually Batalia. We've gone along Batalia. And uh, I saw the tracks. This is where the Unkuhumas came in on Saturday. They came all the way along here, and then they ended up over here somewhere on Saturday. So it's p quite possible he was even following those females. Maybe um, 
the males are all following the Unkuhumas. Maybe they're quite interested in them, and maybe that's why the Unkuhumas are moving as much as they are. Got young males on their tail. Interesting dynamics indeed with the lions at the moment. Okay, Jillian, well, let's have a quick look at this. If you get, can you get that there, Craig? Eh? Bird of prey, they are quite large. And they, mo most of them that I'm aware of, build what we call a platform nest. That's because the bird itself is quite large. And the, they need to sit on top of there, not just to uh, look after the eggs, but also to sometimes bring back meat and, fe and feed. And uh, with many, many raptors, there'll be two eggs. Some of them, it's only one. And quite often, the youngster will, uh, one of the youngsters will kill the other one. It's quite common in raptors. But also, it happens that you rear two, but it's not that common. Um, but the reason it's flat, it's, it's quite high up. They don't really have too much of a building ability when it comes to weaving. So they just layer sticks on top of sticks in the fork of a tree and hope that it stays there. And they will use them again and again and just add to it. So it's purely the size. They don't have a very sort of um, weaver-like beaks to do too much with the, the sticks up there. So by just sort of piling the sticks on, it makes a bit of a platform which enables the eggs to stay inside the platform. So sort of like a, a concave top, you would say. And that's enough space for the adults to sit as well. Uh, for the second adult to maybe fly up as well and drop some meat on there for the, the female that is roosting or uh, should I say um, incubating and then when the chicks are getting bigger also enable them to move around YouTube viewer most eggs need to be set on for incubation you get different types of um, incubation strategies you get synchronistic and you get asynchronistic and asynchronistic means that when the first egg is laid the parents start sitting on it obviously you can you must imagine or realize that a bird doesn't just pop out three or four eggs at the same time it takes on average about 24 hours to produce a new egg depending on the, the bird and the species and the size and so if they lay more than one egg and it is asynchronistic in what hornbills do they will lay the first egg and they'll start sitting on it and then while the second egg is sort of being created inside of the, the female she's already started the incubation process so there's 24 hours on that egg versus the new one so what you're going to get is you're going to get eggs hatching at different stages you do sometimes get birds called synchronistic which means they wait for all the eggs to have laid before they start incubating and then all those chicks will hatch at the same time that's very very common with ground nesting birds you want them all to come out at the same time you don't want to be hanging around a ground nest waiting for individuals to come and the asynchronistic and what normally works for the strongest will hatch first the strongest will be bigger and the second egg is often a sort of an insurance policy so if the first one hatches like what happens in cranes and then they just abandon the second one they just leave uh, what happens in ground hornbills as well they'll lay two and as soon as the first one hatches they basically abandon the second one so it's all an insurance policy and uh, but they do need incubation without the incubation they will not hatch. They need, what, 30-odd something degrees. So they need the, bir the bird to be sitting on it. I hope that answers your question, YouTube viewer. On we go. Okay, well, I was looking forward to heading up towards the north east to find some elephant but it seems mystic david gitu found them first and so from david's elephant and for my birds let's go see how the bushwalk team is getting on well we are getting on just wonderfully because we've come here to a termite mound where there could potentially have been a leopard maybe sitting on the top of the termite mound or up in one of these wonderful trees that we have here and uh one of them is the brown ivory, which is the fruit that we, that we just showed you. And um, Herbie has now shown us that these fruits are wonderfully sweet and very tasty. And so we've started to eat a, a few of them, but Herbie's got a whole handful of them here. And Herbie, I'm sure you, you used to eat these when you were small, didn't you? Yes. And who taught you about these? Um... As a naughty boys, we used to go out, use other sticks or climb up trees, 
to collect these, the brown ivories. But the, the disadvantage on collecting this is that you might end up breaking your, either your leg or any part of your body by trying to get to the um, top part of the tree. And this time of the year, when you visit hospitals or any special doctors, you'll find children with either broken arm or a leg. But because they've been trying to get to the top to get to the sweet exactly. ones. <laughs> exactly. Well, Herbie's definitely got the, the most there. And we've been trying our luck. Darby's been throwing his sticks up. I've been getting my sticks and throwing them up. And uh, tell you what, it's a nice sweet snack that we've got. Obviously, um, uh, uh, fruiting now in the autumn months. So a fantastic time for us. If we don't find any leopard, well, we just spend some time collecting berries and uh, uh, it's almost breakfast time, but we're just, we're just tying ourselves over here with some, uh, some nice fruit. And um, I tell you, if you do eat it, it's, uh, if, if you think of the physiology of, um, of these trees, how clever they are, because we eat the edges off and on the inside there's a very hard pip I'll just open it up for you a little bit there. A very hard pip that obviously, you know, monkeys, baboons, uh, even jackals, everything's going to be eating this and either spitting it out or probably more likely swallowing the whole thing. But that pip on the inside is then going to be transported into the uh, feces and dropped in a completely different place. And then it's got a wonderful site for it to germinate from. So... It's, it's wonderful. So it's wonderful for the tree, wonderful for the animals, and wonderful for us, eh? Yep, yep. I like it. So you either sun dry them, like this one, or you eat them while they're still fresh like this. But my favorites are the dried ones. Mm. The dry ones a little bit. And do they cook with them anything, or do you know anything of the of um, cooking with it, or you yeah. just eat like that? You just eat them like this, but I know some of the people have tried to make beer with these. Where they'll collect them in big numbers into a jar, put some, add some water, leave them for a, two to three days to ferment, and they'll enjoy the beer. Okay, because I suppose that at this time of year there's no marulas. Yes. So if you, you can, uh, right, at this time of year you can still continue to make beer, but we use the brown ivory when it goes to autumn. Yes. Uh -huh. And is there something you can use in winter? Uh, not really, not really. This is the only fruit that I know. So it's probably the latest part of the year that we get the fruit, huh? Because yes. the milk berries, there's no fruit. The marulas, there's no fruit. False marulas, no fruit. Everything is now starting to lose its leaves. Yeah. And uh, brown ivory, good one for this, time of, year. this time of the year. That's it, everybody. So, yeah, 